everyone, and welcome to the Biomed Device Silicon Valley event here in the San Jose Convention Center. We're thrilled to have you join us today. Uh, if you're wandering the aisles and you'd uh, like to come stop by uh, our presentation this morning, we'd really appreciate it. Our uh, panelists uh, today uh, on a topic uh, that I know is probably on the minds of a lot of people around uh, global manufacturing, especially with some of the supply chain issues that uh, our country is facing. Uh, we've got three uh, really industry experts here to talk a little bit about um, some of the challenges and how to overcome those. So uh, if you would please help me welcome uh, our panel moderator, Noreen King, the president and CEO of Evolve Manufacturing. Thank you. Hi, uh, we were asked to do this talk about six months ago, and um, actually everything has changed 150% since then. So um, I thought first we would just talk a little bit about our backgrounds, um, because what, the, what we're discussing is kind of colored by the, uh, by the experience that we have and the kind of equipment we've worked on and stuff. Um, it may not apply in all instances. So um, I think first, can we start with uh, Kevin O'Brien? Introduce yourself real quick. Hi, I'm Kevin O'Brien. Um, my career the next year will be 40 years in the industry. And I'd like to say I started when I was 10, but I don't think you'll believe that. Um, my career has spanned span primarily high value low volume capital medical equipment, ranging from radiation therapy accelerators, radio surgery, Linux, uh, diagnostic ultrasound, um, vascular robotics, and then even outside of the therapeutic diagnostic medical space, a robotic hair transplant system. So, uh, and in all of these scenarios, it's been an environment of high engineering, or a high degree of engineering iteration, so design transfer, was um, always going on between engineering and manufacturing. And so, you know, to give you context, that's the, where I'm coming from in terms of my, my comments that you're, you'll be hearing. Hello, I'm Arnold Kabwang. I'm a local Bay Area resident, graduated from UC Berkeley, uh, not a quite as much years as uh, Kevin, but getting there, 37th year as an engineer in my career, the last 28 years in the medical device world, highly trained manufacturing engineering uh, professional, uh, focused on lean manufacturing, cost efficiency, productivity, uh, worked on medical devices class one, class two, class three, from uh, inception, uh, uh, prototyping, pre-production to commercialization. And uh, certainly continuously uh, in my career, I focus highly on quality as well as uh, uh, the, the integrity of the product that my group, my crew, and our customers value. Um, so I'm Noreen King, and my career has been spent also in capital equipment, high high um, value, low volume stuff. So for me, um, manufacturing overseas was always kind of <clears throat> not, didn't make sense lots of the time. So um, I think that kind of colors our experience here. If we were making something like high volume, like Q-tips or something, then obviously we would have a different angle. So I hope if what we're saying, if it doesn't make sense to you, it's because we're probably coming from a different spot than you are. Um, so I think the first question that we have, we have a bunch of questions here that um, people wanted to hear um, answers about, and then feel free to jump in and ask any questions about it, and then we'll also have um, 10 minutes for questions at the end. So um, the first question was, um, what are the top challenge challenges faced by medical device manufacturers when launching a new product? So would you like to start, Kevin? Or? Sure, sure. Um, in my experience, the number one issue is time to market. Um, it's just a mad rush to get that, that new design it, out of engineering and into manufacturing such that you can start the revenue stream for the company um, and or to get clinical feedback. So it's always an absolute race. Um, sometimes the, uh, you know, it's not fully baked, uh, but you, you you launch it while and, and sort of finish it on its way. And what that results in is a, an incredibly high degree of interaction that's required between design engineering and manufacturing. 
because of the the newness of the design, and it just iterates. It's you know it, in the fields that I mentioned, um, it's just been a, a a constant iterate faster than the competition. That's that's how you beat them to deliver new features, new new capabilities um, as fast as you can. Um, the second big issue that then as soon as you do get into manufacturing is to reduce cost of goods because usually you'll get a pass for an expensive product first out of the gate, but that pass disappears pretty shortly. Then the pressures of the just the ec economics hit. And so there's going to be a, a push for um, how to make the manufacturing process more efficient, design out cost and or change processes. And again, uh, you can't do that without this, this uh, collaboration between the, the design folks. So, you know, when you, you guys do um, design a product and launching the product, and so I imagine it's very hard for people to select uh, a person to do that for them because there's always iterations, like no engineering design is ever perfect out of the gate, right? The first, first thing. So when you're saying to someone, I'm, I, I need like four months to do this, whatever, I'm sure there's guys out there saying, I can do it in two months and less expensive, but then that actually doesn't happen and then it ends up being nine or 10 months and probably twice as much money. So how do you educate like people on that sort of thing? You need to pick the right partner, one that is going to be able to handle what you just described. Um, right. And in some cases I've seen where your, your manufacturing partner is set up for that, where they have the initial um, area is, is dedicated for new product introduction, and they expect um, a, a large amount of chaos. Um, admittedly, you, you wish it wasn't there, but it's going to happen. Um, and it, it's an education going back the other way to the powers that be, so to speak, that say, "Oh, we need to do this in you know the you know in two months." Um, realistically, it, it's it's not going to happen in two months, and sometimes it just you do have to suffer some scar tissue to, to prove your point. Right, so then I guess oftentimes you have to decouple the person who's gonna do the manufacturing from the person who does the prototyping for you <clears throat> because um, the, the iteration process would be very, very long if you were overseas yeah. for the early stage, right? It's a different skill set. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you want um, people who are doing prototyping are it's a different skill set than steady state, no change production. And, and right. you need to understand that. So then when you hit that speed bump, then I think you, you know you have, it's all bets are off because now you have to um, go th get through that process. And then when you're ready to launch product and buy a thousand, now you have a brand new startup in the other country. Right. Right, right. so it's, it adds another like layer to the whole scene, right? Which I think people don't really anticipate that. It's reality, though. Right, yeah. I, I would uh, further highlight what Kevin said, which is time to market. Internally, uh, a high-level project management person or crew in, in the company is certainly um, uh, noted because uh, if we, a product is to be delivered within four, six, eight months, time is very uh, tight and partnering with the right uh, manufacturer is of essence. And uh, in today's world, supply chain is also a key factor that needs to be highly considered. So all of the above are very vital towards the success in the, achieving the milestones of a project. Yeah, I would agree. Um, so let me ask the next question is um, the number one reason people manufacture overseas is to reduce unit cost. Like, there's no doubt about that. They, they understand that the other costs can be higher, but the unit cost is very attractive. Are there things that you guys have encountered in your career that happen that have unexpected more costs than, than what was, like, modeled when they were doing this planning? Do you want to? My experience and my team's experience utilizing overseas uh, manufacturers have both been uh, positive as well as the other way around. Uh, one is logistics. Obviously, when you go overseas, there's a big time indifference. 
there, is, there are logistical challenges, some communication issues, um, and others that need to be taken into consideration. Because as we all know, uh, we are following the uh, project timeline and all of the above are important to consider. And cost is definitely a, a major factor. However, uh, we have to look at the other uh, challenge, potential challenges that can be had during the, uh, the course of uh, uh, in, uh, collaborating with a, an overseas manufacturer. In terms of costs that may not be um, anticipated, I can think of one having to do with logistics where in order to smooth out the, the, the process, we sent engineers from the U.S. overseas, um, and you think that may not be such a big deal, but it's, it is a cost. It is disruptive to um, you know, the plans for that person or persons that were back here in, on, in, you know, on the home soil, so to speak. Um, and sometimes you don't think about little things like that that can just mushroom and say, well, it's, it's what needed to get done and we sent this person there and they're gone for weeks at a time. Yeah, I think um, uh, what you have to anticipate is something's going to go wrong no matter where you manufacture anything. And so you have to kind of count that in and you have to assume maybe two, three times a year you're going to have to air freight all your product or something, some disaster is going to happen and how do you like recover? So I think people who have staff on the ground all the time have a better chance of success, but um, that is something that you have to count in. So I think people do not put in the overhead um, costs into their unit costs, because that is a reality. Um, if you're manufacturing locally, you can quickly get your machine shop over that day to your manufacturer, and you guys can work it out. Um, but if it's overseas, you've already lost two days before you even have the first conversation, oftentimes. So depending on weekends and all. So anyways, I think that this is the stuff that they don't, people don't think of. And also, I think inventory, you have to have tons more inventory, millions of dollars more inventory if you're going to be manufacturing somewhere that's like four weeks away. And I, you know, on a boat, and uh, I think that's not factored in. And then the scrap. So when you have design changes, so I guess the more stable the product, the more like once the product is very mature and stable. But like nowadays, I feel like we're going away from stability and towards like changing. You know, I, I had an instance one time where I was leading a new product introduction team, and the VP of manufacturing told me that I was number 11 on his top 10 list because we kept changing stuff. <laughs> That's so depressing. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so what's the next question? Um, uh, what, so what factors should manufacturers consider when they're deciding where to manufacture their product? Do you want that, Kevin? Or? Um, again, I'll go back to, um, you know, is it a match for the partner, or, or the partnership, I mean? Um, all the things that were, you've mentioned, uh, um, you know, are they, uh, can they accommodate uh, a rate of change? Again, my comments are coming from a context of, of a high degree of design iteration constantly. Um, but even once you launch the product into manufacturing, are they, um, uh, is your manufacturing partner receptive of the, the degree of ECOs that, that they're going to expect and how are they going to handle things such as um, all right this ECO uh, um, obsoletes certain parts within the design so who pays for that or and or are there ways to to mitigate the the direct scrap cost can your manufacturing partner work with you to either sell that inventory or find some other way that it's just not a pure scrap cost yeah, I think the transparency is really difficult sometimes when you're with working overseas. And so cutting in new designs is kind of probably delayed because um, you have to use up the in inventory that, they've, that you've committed to on your contract. They're not going to be like, oh, hang on, let me... No, I don't think so. <laughs> They'll be like, you owe me for this. So, um, yeah, furthermore, uh, 
selecting a uh, part contract manufacturing partner with your products is very um, important to every company, of course, be because what I look for if I was a customer is the, the manufacturer's experience, expertise, proficiency, the, uh, ex the uh, re reliability in the products that they have previously produced for other companies. I, I think a lot of homework needs to be uh, uh, incorporated while selecting or prior to selecting a contract manufacturing company uh, locally and domestically. Mm. Yeah, I think um, where the products are consumed is very, very critical. If the whole market is here, and especially medical device, um, then it does not make as much sense to manufacture far away. Um, and so I think that's very, very important, right? And, and just to add to that, and in some countries, if you're going to sell into their country, they're going to right. re require, require you to, right. to build, right. to employ their people. So right. in some instances, that, you know, where you are is, is somewhat predefined. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, it depends on if your intellectual property is important or not. If not, no problem. But if it is, you might want to have a strategy on how to control that, right? You might want to put your final test in a, the U.S. or someplace like that. Um, so, um, how does lean manufacturing play into this current supply chain crisis? So, I will address that. Uh, many companies that I've worked with and work for uh, deploy lean manufacturing initiatives, and uh, some have been extremely successful. Hence, they would like to put that downstream onto the contract manufacturing companies that they're dealing with, suppliers as well, too. And many suppliers and manufacturers are, uh, can easily adapt to it, but some cannot. Uh, the majority of those that are successfully incorporating lean manufacturing into their system with their customers are the ones that are here uh, locally and domestically. And uh, my experience going out of, uh, out of the uh, USA has been um, not just minimal, but been challenging because of various factors. It could be a different ERP system. It could be different approaches to methodologies. But at the same time, the concept of lean must go throughout into the, down to the supply chain because uh, it is essential for each organization as they continue to establish their infrastructure, uh, building the products towards commercialization. So definitely lean is a must as the product matures. And uh, in, li in line with that and in parallel to that would be utilizing the suppliers and manufacturers to do so as well. But that, Kevin, no. I, I, I find this very maddening because I, re I read a lot online and in the news about lean manufacturing being part of the supply chain problem. It couldn't be because we don't do any lean manufacturing anymore. Lean manufacturing means you manufacture close to the consumer. China is not close to any consumers uh, in this country. And um, so lean manufacturing is actually the solution to stuff like this. And I use a very simple example. Um, when COVID hit, you know, we probably had hundreds of containers full of genes on the way from China that sat and are probably maybe still sitting out there on, on the bay. And um, if we were doing lean manufacturing, we would just switch our machines over to stretchy material like that week and, and everyone would be happy. Um, and so I feel like, um, these very, very important people have this so wrong. And they're saying, oh, because you didn't have a lot of inventory in your, on your production floor, that's the reason that we have supply chain problems right now. And it's obviously an extremely complicated thing. But trust me, lean manufacturing is actually the solution. And it's something that got abandoned about 30 years ago. When I first started working, um, we were very excited about implementing lean, implementing just-in-time, artificial intelligence, automation. And then within a couple of years, it all went away and it all went to China. And there wasn't a huge incentive to um, evolve manufacturing, no pun, <laughs> <laughs> because labor is so inexpensive in those areas. So they didn't have to, um, you know, it didn't make, it doesn't make sense to automate until your costs become higher um, 
to not automate. And so, um, and so now I feel like we're at that point because automation has become much less expensive because of processing of, you know, chip processing, software, all of these things have evolved tremendously. And I think now is the time that automation is going to make a ton of sense. And um, when you take out the labor, um, then we become very competitive in the U.S. And I, I do think on the stuff we manufacture, it's only about 10% is labor, and the rest is materials. And materials is normally like an uh, international cost. It doesn't matter too much from, from location to location. So um, anyway, that's I'll get off my <laughs> soapbox. <laughs> so um, how does it end? Uh, what do you think will change because of this pandemic? The, certainly the pandemic has a lot, uh, played a lot of effect onto manufacturing organizations. Uh, some companies utilize uh, manual labor to do assemblies, some semi-automation, but I think uh, now the, the, the notion of working from home uh, can be uh, okay with certain functions of a, an organization. But in manufacturing, certainly, it's got to be on site. If not 100%, the, but the majority is going to be on site. Having said that, I, throughout my career, utilize a lot of manual labor, uh, putting together catheters, class one, class two, and class three devices uh, in the factory, in the plant. Now, how do you do that when we have um, certain regulations of uh, COVID protocols in today's world? Well, one approach would be automation, mechanization of some of the activities that are happening at work. And therefore, one, you could eliminate some functions that the machine can do semi-automatically or fully automated. Secondly, uh, the, the cost certainly goes down. Capital goes up a little bit, but the ROI will be eventually absorbed within several months or a couple years, depending on the, the type of equipment. And number three, the, the overall uh, incentive of automation, semi-automation, mechanization of certain processes in a manufacturing organization is certainly a big plus in today's world and for the future. One thing I guess I wanted to ask was um, the impact on, on labor availability. We're, we're, we're at a triple ring. We were able to continue to a large degree with people working from home, but on the other hand, a large part of our work required specialized facilities and uh, like a biosafety lab. And no one has that at home, at least I hope they don't. And so, um, you know, we were, but to do that work, you're already suited up with full PPE. So that was kind of a no, no change. I'm curious in your respective worlds, the, um, the impact of the pandemic on labor availability. Yeah, for us, um, labor is very difficult. Um, for some reason, a lot of people have life-changing thoughts and, and retired or changed careers and stuff like that. Not so much away from manufacturing, but I find that there's less people in the, in the pool available to us, especially very difficult to find engineering, um, even like interns, you know? Just, yeah. There's not a lot of people out there. I, a lot, everybody seems to be employed who wants to be employed right now, so. I, I would say from my, from my perspective, what I think will change with the pandemic, I think people will have more respect for manufacturing now. I think a lot of people have more interest in it. And I think that people will be more, um, want to know the depth of their supply chain, like where down to the last screw, where things are sourced. I think before people didn't put much thought, they just placed an order with the big CM and they didn't worry about it. And I think now they're going to realize that there is some like tough things that are very deep down into the product that are very simple, but that will stop the production. And, um, and I think that they'll be more um, interested in asking, how are you doing this? What, you know, what are your challenges? And so there'll be more of a partnership kind of attitude with suppliers. And so, yeah. um, what else? And so what advice do you guys have for people? Um, this is perhaps is uh, going to sound obvious, but um, you know, expect that, as mentioned, things are going to go wrong. And so come up with 
you know, beforehand, what, you know, what, what if you can't get the parts you need? Or what if, um, uh, I don't think anyone could say, what if a pandemic hit? But um, uh, just work through all the scenarios beforehand and have some sort of plan, because those plans get a little more complicated when you're dealing with, with overseas partners. Um, you mentioned, you know, it's, it's two-day turnaround uh, for communication. And, and if it's a critical issue where you're measuring the solution in hours, the, the, those are very, very painful days. Final two. So the, the notion of uh, risk management, risk assessment, uh, growing up as an engineer, we call it FMEA, uh, as Kevin stated, that things can and may go wrong, what do you do? Well, you gotta have the uh, plan A, plan B, plan C, but there are certain things in the, in, in the uh, uh, R&D world, in the prototyping world, that things gotta happen quickly. Now, logistically, and as I stated earlier, locally, things can happen relatively quick, fast. Now, if we go elsewhere outside of this country, certainly time difference, uh, maybe you won't get an answer the next day, until the next day, 18 hours later or so. Uh, some companies don't mind, but certainly most of the companies that we deal with want their answers just like you, ASAP. And I, I think that is very vital to this, uh, to this topic of discussion regarding um, manufacturing locally and domestically. Yeah, my, my advice, I spend a lot of the time on the phone these days working through these supply chain issues with people. And my advice is to really just get into the details with them as to if I do this, will you, if, you, if this happens, then what happens, then what happens? So that later in three weeks, things seem to change drastically. You can go back to say, but I thought <laughs> you said you had that part or whatever. Because we're finding that people are just like throwing their hands up and just not even trying to manage this. And I think the people who figure this stuff out are going to be successful, and I think a lot of people are going to go out of business. I mean, for sure. There is like, uh, we have suppliers who are quoting like nine months for something that should take uh, three weeks. We can't live with that. So they're gonna, we're going to have to figure something out without them. <laughs> so, um, And I do think also, remember, I, I think it's going to get much worse before it gets better. I, I think this is... I think the end of next year, maybe it'll start improving, but I think we have an awful year ahead of us. I hope I'm wrong, but that's what I think from the supply chain point of view. So I think, are we gonna have some questions now from the audience, if anybody has something? Hi. What are customers telling you uh, especially uh, larger customers um, or related to the opportunity to manufacture locally for the big markets like North America, Europe, Asia Pac. Do you think that the big med tech players are going to want to structure regional supply chains? And how critical is that from a contract manufacturer point of view to have the ability to serve clients that reach those high volumes, global market access with a local presence and therefore, you know, opening shop in China, in, in Europe, in low cost uh, countries. Yeah, I do think people are, um, for, first of all, the big guys that we work with, they are buying like a year's worth of supply, which is ridiculous. I mean, um, and so they're eating up all of the parts from the other guys who can't afford to do that. And, um, and they're struggle. I think they're panicked all of them, and I think they're getting very creative. And I think they are starting to do manufacturing where their consumption is. Um, so, you know, if everything is being consumed in Europe, I think that they ha they're looking into opening up places close by Europe. I mean, for us, we haven't really tapped into, um, you know, um, uh, North America, which, like South, uh, you know, south of here, Mexico, these kind of places. I think that's where, um, in my opinion, we have underutilized, and so hopefully that, that will improve. So, um. Um, furthermore, uh, 
we, uh, five years ago, we, in my other company, we had a major OEM um, that were, were, was relatively shy of approaching local manufacturers because, of course, low-cost manufacturing overseas, uh, meaning over the oceans, uh, uh, across the pond, et cetera. Uh, and, but right before the pandemic hit, they have turned around completely and gradually brought back a lot of their components, sub-assemblies, and some semi-full uh, assemblies into the states, a lot of it here locally. And they also uh, contacted us this time around rather than us uh, chasing them. And I've talked to a number of their engineers, their managers, and the majority of them stated that um, quality is of essence. Uh, cost is definitely important, but if there's a cost of a quality associated to it, then might as well stick with quality, where we all here in, in the States have ISO 1345 or what have you. The other thing, too, is logistics and the, the, the difference in, in, um, in communication and the time of communication, when you receive your answers, and how uh, Kevin mentioned earlier, ECOs being turned around quickly, locally, domestically. So therefore, it, or, to address your question, there are various uh, factors associated with uh, the comparison of overseas manufacturing versus domestic. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I think that the, the people are looking at the total cost now and before, and it, it's, it's difficult because in large companies, everybody just has their only little tiny piece of the elephant and they're all optimizing their piece. So I think this is going to elevate manufacturing to a higher level in the company so they'll be more strategic. Additional questions? Uh, yeah, I'm interested in knowing how you business owners are coping with the, one of the biggest challenges that we see at, at Peridot is recruiting and, and the extreme shortage of skilled labor and even non-skilled labor is becoming increasingly more difficult to source. And so I'm curious to leverage off of your techniques and tricks that are <laughs> opaque to me right now. If the world has changed. For me, I have to hire a lot of people, and um, low-skilled people, but they're working in a clean room sometimes, so they have to be trained on protocols and stuff. So I thought to myself, okay, that's sort of like kitchen, right? That's like working in a kitchen. You don't have to be very, you know, a brain surgeon or anything, but you have to follow rules. So we found a lot of luck trying to find people from the service industry in um, the food industry for that. Then. Now I'm like, oh my God, where am I gonna get like high level technicians? I can't find them. Like if I could find semiconductor technicians right now, I'd be a gazillionaire in about five years because there's too much work, but I can't find them. So I started thinking about maybe automotive people and, and, and people, I got a very good suggestion from someone the other day who he said, you know, the automotive industry is changing tremendously over towards electrical cars. So those guys, their, their jobs are gonna be limited and there's no there's hardly any maintenance on, a, on an electric car so i'm thinking of trying to recruit from that kind of an industry so trying to get creative on what skills are similar in other industries but i agree with you, it's very difficult and people like the pay and the inflation we've had to raise everybody's salary it's very difficult so i i commiserate commiserate with you <laughs> in uh, our organization at Protoquick, Peridot, CESA, the, the and gentlemen uh, pr provided us a very good um, challenge nowadays in recruitment. We have utilized local and domestic recruiters. We posted online, uh, whether it's LinkedIn and others. Um, we have some bites, but not the typical uh, uh, employees that we would like to recruit. Uh, I, again, Noreen stated, look at other industries that have available um, 
potential hardworking individuals that are trainable, uh, but in specific to the trade of engineering or machine operations. Now, those are more challenging situations to train a, an average Joe like myself, uh, and because those skills take years to really develop. So it is a challenge in today's world. I was just speaking with a recruiter, a medical device recruiter, whom I've utilized for over 20 years, and in her website, she has a list of 30 jobs that she is, has not been filled uh, for weeks on end, and, and uh, she has declined to accept my, uh, my request to help us out. So it is a challenge in today's world. However, that doesn't stop us from continuously searching and recruiting uh, available folks out there that are really willing to learn, really willing to be trained on the jobs that we do in-house. And that's similar to what we're doing at Triple Ring, where, where as, um, we're a co-development engineering services company. Um, when we're looking for a, a, a person where typically, you know, well experienced, 10 years plus, very specialized, um, and they're almost unobtainium. And so internally, we are having to change our approach and say, well, we're going to need to look more for the the new college hire or someone who's you know newly new into industry and leverage some of our more senior people to grow them internally because looking for you know looking for the plug and play person just isn't there we're going to have to to some degree create our own additional questions comments how do you train those new people? Hey, hello. How do you train those new people? You know, there is there is a big challenge how to train the new people as fast as possible to uh, to to start working. Do you have some uh, secret sauce for this? <laughs> I don't know about secret sauce, but it, it it takes a reinforcing of your senior people to to you know this is now part of their job to not only. Um, do what they like to do, what they've been doing, but also to mentor and train the the junior engineers, so to speak. Um, and in some cases, they're going to need to develop those skills. You know, it's 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 hard being a teacher. I, I, I will, my kids will tell you I'm a lousy teacher, so uh, um, I, I recognize it's really hard. First thing, be good to your existing ones because they're gonna. If they leave, then you're you're done, right? Before you train the other guys and break it down into smaller pieces too, so that people are qualified only for certain portions of the job, um, because it's going to take years to get people up up to speed. Um, in regards to the training. Um, you know, I've got a few gray hairs on my head from the reason back in the 80s and the 70s, a lot of the large tier one or large, you know, the IBMs of the world, the NCRs of the world, all had training programs and they got rid of them, partly because the smaller companies pilfered all their good people. Well, again, now it seems like they're having to bring that skill set back up. So I think in a couple of years, we'll be able to pilfer from them again you know, in that <laughs> regards, because uh, you'll, the smaller companies will give them better opportunities. Um, so from my perspective, another question I have, and I don't know if you can answer this, um, I come from the EMS environment. I think from a metals and plastic standpoint, you can still get parts here. My concern is there's a lot of good reshoring happening from a PCBA standpoint. Um, man, there is a, talking about there's not enough boats coming this way to get PCBAs built here. The concern I have is China's not stupid. They realize they're losing the, the PCBA business but 95% of our parts are built in China. When do you think they're gonna finally say, yeah, guys, you know, we're not gonna let you have your parts. You know, how quickly are we gonna have our suppliers, our semi guys understand? I mean, some of the semis you're seeing now, you know, they started building uh, in Phoenix. You know, there's a bunch that are doing there. There's actually some being built in Germany now of all places, which is a high labor content place. So I get concerned more from the fact that I mean, I've, I've, so when you were talking about Central America, I have a plant down in Costa Rica. I, I tried to talk to somebody to do work local, and the first thing he said, oh, Terry, oh, how about your Costa Rica plant? Because they want that. 
I'm still, and then the other factor right now, they don't get hit with the, you know, the 25% from coming from that area, getting stuff built, that if you get it from China right now. Um, but I'm still worried about, you know, there's going to be connectors, there's going to be diodes, resistors, all that kind of stuff coming from China that, you know, he's, he's going to shut us off. He's just going to shut us off. He's got to. I mean, I, I, I got to be a realist, you know. I mean, I, I mean, he just came out, they just, China just came out with this last week where basically they said any kind of data you're bringing in is now going to be our data. Like I want to give my PCBAs up to the Chinese government because all they're going to do is use it later and sell it at 30% reduction cost and I'll never be able to sell into the billion four people that are in China. So, sorry. I, I think we all need each other. So I think, I think it's gonna, we're going to be codependent for a, a long time. I mean, yeah, it would take like seven years for us to create a plant that will make the semiconductor chips, you know, it takes a very, very long time. So I think we're gonna be, this is an extremely volatile, very complicated time. But I think in the long term, I think people are, the governments now should understand that like putting all your eggs in one basket doesn't make sense. And I, cause I remember we couldn't even make masks at the beginning of this. We did not, I mean, that's insane. Like, um, very exposed. So I, I think that uh, I think the lesson has been hopefully learned, but maybe not. We probably have time for one more question. Um, is there somebody over here with their hand raised? Oh, way down on the end. Hi, uh, Noreen. I really liked your comment about uh, businesses partnering with CMs to think about supply chain and. I think you kind of gave a little bit of an example as it relates to when things become a problem. Could you maybe describe what would you think of as ideal in terms of partnership in supply chain analysis upstream of the issues? Yeah, I think um, for us, we, first of all, I used to kind of, I used to be on the other side of the table buying from contract manufacturers and I found that I had to really support them um, and help them because sometimes they didn't have the skills in, in their company to, to manage it. But I feel like, yeah, everybody has to have a partnering a, a approach and being open and honest with one another. So I, like for instance, show my customers the component cost of everything on the, on the bill of material. And um, there's a downside to that. But the upside is they understand my problems and they don't ask me for the unobtainable. Like, okay, I want a 30% cost reduction. Well, you know, that means like this, this, the parts are 70%, so like that can't happen. So I think being able to, op when you're open book like that, then they can see, oh wow, this one part is like $60, I had no idea. And then we can work together as partners and then they become successful, I become successful. So I think that that's one thing that, I like to work with customers like that, that have that partnering kind of attitude, so. Thank you so much.